beautiful truth you can learn from adoption, even human adoptions and the application there. Praise the Lord, we're adopting the family of God. Great to see everybody here this morning. Let's pray. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church this Sunday morning. Father, bless this day. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for the beautiful day you've given to us. Thank you for bringing this crowd out today. And may we be encouraged by our, the presence of each other, the fellowship, most of all by your presence today. Speak to our hearts through song and message and the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. All right, all four verses of 262, please. 262. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you believe for the victory win? Oh, there's wonderful power in the blood. But there is power, power, one working power in the blood. Of the land, there is power, power, one working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Now for a cleansing to Calvary's time. Oh, there's wonderful power in the blood. Well, there is power, 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 one working power. Of the land, oh, there is power, 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 in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wiser, much wiser than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in his life, in his life. Oh, it's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power. everybody here this morning. As always, I want to recognize any visitors that might be here with us this morning. For the bus, if you don't mind, make your way on up here. I'll have you talk about the Show Me Gospel Project this morning. Push it a little bit. We're excited about that. If you have not received your visitor's card, I know we have some visitors, but you, maybe you've already received it. But if you have not received it at this time, we'd like you to raise your hand so our ushers can give you a visitor's card. And uh, that way you can fill it out. And then at the end of the services, you can trade it out at the back, back there on my right. You're left out in the foyer for a small gift from our church. So always great to have visitors. I know they're here. They must have already gotten their visitor card. Great. Great to have all of you here. Appreciate you being in the church services today. Well, yesterday, big thank you to, uh, let's see, Brother Gary, I think, helped a little bit with it, uh, Miss Heather and Brother Brian. And we had 39 people go on the float trip, and we did a lot of amazing things. Uh, let's see. We, we, we floated during a thunderstorm. That was awesome. We threw rocks at each other, and we jumped out of a dead tree. Well, the tree wasn't totally dead, but that was awesome. And uh, we had a great time, and we swam right after we ate. So it was, we did all the things you're never supposed to do, but 39 of us had a great time floating down the Merrimack yesterday. Appreciate the teens and college and career activity, and they invited me to come along. We had a great time there. Water was nice and cold. We appreciate that, and it was great. Thank you so much for organizing that. Also, thanks, Brother Bussy, preaching Wednesday night. Got to hear the message. Camp was great. 
eight salvations this week, eight salvations, and, uh, and uh, one, I think one young man turned to preach and then many other decisions, and it was a good week, smaller week again because of COVID, all the weeks have been smaller this summer, but just thankful God has allowed us to still get busy this summer and uh, be a blessing, and then also be blessed by many of the camps and conferences that we were part of, but done now, signing off uh, for this summer, but thankful that COVID did not stop all the camps from doing things, lots of teenagers got fired up and right, and so we praise the Lord for that, and God sure is good there. Well, now we get to shift our energy to something very exciting, and that starts this Friday and Saturday. Before the choir sings, I want Brother Busty to come up and remind us of what we have going on in the wonderful Show Me State. Amen. All right. Well, we've been praying for several months now about the Show Me Gospel Project, um, and so we'll be putting together 30,000 John and Romans this Friday and Saturday. And so we need all hands on deck. Make sure you sign up for that. See Miss Heather get signed up. And uh, But on Friday from 5 to 9, you can come anytime during that. We'll be in the fellowship hall. And then on Saturday, 10 to 3. And uh, so I want you to come and be a part of that, putting together and praying over that and seeing um, all, all that process. It'll be wonderful. So I want you, want you to make sure that you're here. And then also, I want you to pray about uh, being a part of distributing them. There are about 28,000 doors in Cole County we'd like. Uh, our goal is by the end of the year to have all those doors receive a John and Romans. And that's only going to happen through prayer and through our feet getting a little tired, okay? And uh, so I want to make sure you'll be a part of that and uh, physically. And then also, I'd like for you to be a part of that financially. And uh, so pray about what the Lord have you doing that. But make sure you be here on Friday and Saturday and pray about it. I'm excited what the Lord's going to do through His Word. There's power in God's Word, isn't there? And uh, so I'm excited about giving out John and Romans uh, to the residents of Cole County. And after that, uh, that's not the end of the vision. We'll continue to do the outerlying areas. And if the Lord allow, the whole, uh, whole state of Missouri. And who knows what the Lord will do after that. So we're looking forward to that. Make sure you're here Friday and Saturday. Any questions, uh, you can see any one of us, uh, me, Miss Heather, uh, my wife, and... Uh, and we'll see what the Lord has. But Friday and Saturday, make sure you're here. Thank you, preacher. Amen. Amen.
Christ is King, for he conquered death once for all. We will live in light of his victory, following his gospel call. And when the story ends, we know Jesus wins, for his power cannot be Sometimes preachers preach about depression. I'm thinking if we got a hold of the truth of that song, it might be enough. Amen. On your feet, number 391, please. I am resolved. We'll sing a verse. We'll wave for remotely and talk for a little bit, and then we'll finish the song. I am resolved no longer to linger in time by the words we And I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free, hasten glad and free. Jesus, greatest I is, I will come to thee. All right, from your places, greet one another. Please, verse 3, 391. I have resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he will, he is the living way. And I will hasten to him, hasten so glad, hasten glad and preach. Oppose me, foes may be set, but still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, let's take our Bible to First Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5. While you're turning, it's been good to have Allison with us for a week. She went with us to camp, and uh, she leaves back tomorrow. She's a friend of our daughter, my daughter from college, and uh, she gave me a pretty good joke last night. And see, when I say when I give credit to somebody else, they're going to laugh. But if it's me, they won't laugh. If athletes get athletes' feet, what do elves get? Mistletoe. All right. 
See, they laugh pretty good. If I, told, if I told them it was for me, nobody would laugh. They'd boo me off the stage. That's how this church is. But anyway. All right, First Thessalonians 5, look at verse number 16. As soon as the special is over, I'm not coming straight to the pulpit. There's going to be a short one-minute video. Sound you guys are going to have that ready, that video ready to go. And um, it's a video that talks about uh, Kobe Bryant, the basketball player that passed away earlier this year in the helicopter crash. Um, obviously, I don't endorse everything in his life or his lifestyle, but what you'll hear said about him in this one minute should challenge any Christian, and it goes with the message for today, so I hope you'll listen to it very carefully. One minute, it's only about a minute long, and, uh, and just check it out. All right, look at verse 16 with me, First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll give you the title in a little bit after the special. Looking forward to the special this morning. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Some of the shortest verses in the Bible are found right here. Bam, 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 real close. Pray without ceasing and everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Father, help us this morning. Thank you for this truth, this simple truth. We need it. We need to be reminded of it. And encourage our hearts, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. never get bored with the basics. The first time I had a chance to watch Kobe Bryant work out was in 2007, when he was without question the best player on the planet. And I got to watch an early morning private workout. You know what astounded me from that workout? Was not the flash and the sizzle, but was how basic the workout was. For the first 40 minutes, Kobe did nothing but very basic footwork and pivoting drills. Uh, to be honest, I was bored. I couldn't believe it. Here I am watching the best player in the world doing the most basic drills possible. After the workout, which was about two hours long, I asked him, I said, Kobe, you're the best player in the world. Why are you doing the most basic drills? And he just kind of chuckled and looked me in the eye and said, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? The best never get bored with the basics.
and very simple thought, very simple statement there. And uh, those of us that have been parents for any length of time, especially when our kids are younger, I'm sure we heard that statement. And by the way, we're going back to our theme, reminding us of the theme for the year, which is the word again. Christian life is made up of doing things over and over, again and again. And go and throw the title up there, Brother Jason. But we've heard this phrase before. When the kid comes in the living room or the kitchen and says, I'm bored. How many of you ever heard your parents or your kids say that as a parent? And uh, I've heard that from all four of my children through the years. And then mom seemed to have the best answer for it. Well, find something to do, right? How many of you moms have said that statement? That's tonight's message, find something to do. But this morning we want to talk about the subject of I'm bored. I'm bored. I was preaching at a teen retreat several weeks ago in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and the youth pastor made that statement. He talked about that video, and I looked it up and started to research it and began to think about how the Christian life, I think, sometimes we, without realizing it, are saying to our Heavenly Father as His children, I'm bored. We've gotten bored with the basics. We've gotten bored with the things that make the Christian life what it really is. I was uh, also thinking about the fact that we physically must nourish ourselves every day. Some of us nourish ourselves more than others, but the fact is we're supposed to physically nourish ourselves every day. We are to eat healthy, eat well. We eat well as Americans. There's no doubt about that. And we eat, many of us eat breakfast, lunch, supper, and and, uh, we have these meals we eat. But listen, every once in a while, you get to splurge. You do something special. Maybe it's an anniversary. Maybe it's a... uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, your kid graduates from school or, or something exciting happens and you'll, you'll splurge. You'll go to a Roos Chris Steakhouse or you'll go to restaurants that are a little bit more pricey, maybe more out of most of our budgets, but you'll do that as a, as a special treat. But it's not those meals that sustain us over the long haul. It's not. It's the daily scrambled eggs. It's the daily peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's the daily grilled chicken with a side of with a side salad it's the daily meals that we kind of think are boring that actually help us live and get us to the point we're at in our life when I saw that video I thought wow isn't it sad that even some of the world's best athletes or some of the most successful people on this planet never get bored with the little things they never get bored with the basic things that we're supposed to do I've learned this as being a Christian long enough now and been in the ministry long enough now that when you are faithful in the little things and you meet God in the little things, God will then meet you in the big things also. He'll meet you in the big, spectacular Ruth Chris moments of your life, which we all have them from time to time. But may I say to you today that maybe one reason the world has gotten bored with church is because it first started with Christians getting bored with church. The world has gotten bored with the Christian life or even inter- not even entertaining anymore is because Christians have gotten bored with the Christian life because the Christian life really is a simple process, but it's over and over and over the same things we must do. It's the secret to a happy marriage. It's the secret to raising children in a consistent home. It's really not even a secret. One of the most well-known preachers in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, early 50s, I think, was a man named J. Frank Norris. He pastored two churches simultaneously before transportation was as efficient as it is today. He pastored a large church in Dallas, Texas, and a large church in Detroit, Michigan. He also operated a very well-known Bible college, and he, uh, he was training a lot of preachers. In fact, he had influence on the president of his day. He personally wrote a letter to President Harry Truman encouraging him to stand with Israel once Uh, Great Britain uh, left Israel and didn't occupy anymore and and helped Israel become a sovereign state. It was May 11th, I believe, 1948, when Israel became a a state. And I have a copy of a letter I read one time where J. Frank Norris wrote the letter to Harry Truman and said, President Truman, please recognize Israel. Be the first national leader to recognize Israel as a sovereign state. J. Frank Norris one time announced for several weeks to his Bible college, young aspiring preachers, He said, I'm going to tell you the secret to building a great church or to having a successful life and having a happy marriage. He said, I'm going to tell it to you on such and such date at 5 a.m. that morning. And on that particular day, the crowd was packed. All those young college students were sitting there. And J. Frank Norris was about to come through some doors and stand in that pulpit and tell these young men the secret to greatness. And he walked up to the pulpit, and there was a buzz in the air. And he said, wake up at this time every day. And he walked back, and that was it. True story. What a letdown I was to those preacher boys. The point he was making is not that you have to wake up at 5 a.m. every day to be successful, but the fact he was making, the point he was making is this. In the mundane, daily, 
grinding things, do them day in and day in and day in and day out, when the gym is empty, so to speak, when nobody's around, when many are still sleeping, when you find out God's traffic isn't that busy, that's the difference in the Christian walk. The summer I have spent, I spent eight, I was in eight different states in July, and I told somebody on the bus route this morning, this week, I'm excited this week, me and sleep will get acquainted again. It's been a very busy summer still, but I'll tell you one thing, your preacher, and I'm only telling you this as an example, not to brag on me, but to brag on the Lord. One thing I did not compromise, no matter what, I got up every morning early enough to spend some time with God. Last week, while many campers were still sleeping, I got up early enough before the sun got up because I got to get a hold of God that day. I want to talk to God that day. And it's amazing that when you faithfully show up where God is, God will always faithfully be there too. So I think it's a dangerous thing when we send a message to heaven and says, you know what, I'm bored. God the Father will help us find something to do if we don't get busy serving him or being faithful to him. Some of us would use the argument, well, we're just too busy nowadays. Things are just too busy. Listen, you are never too busy to spend time with God. And it's amazing that when you invest that practical day in and day out, again and again, walking with God, how much it helps your busy life become a whole lot more unbusy, if you will. Today, I want to remind you that our theme is the word again. David killed Goliath because of the theme or the principle of again. Esther saved Israel because of the principle of again. Moses led Israel for 40 years because of the principle of again. And Jesus himself ministered in such a way for three and a half years that the Bible says in the book of John that even the books of this world will not contain what he did because of what Jesus did. He did it over and over and over and over again. David was not afraid of that giant because he'd already killed a bear and he had killed a lion. Well, the reason he killed the bear and the lion is because again and again and again he had gotten up and watched his father's flock and tended to the sheep and wrote another psalm and worshiped God. He was a balanced young man who had a ability to kill something with a slingshot, but he also played a harp for the glory of God. I'm telling you, we are missing some of the most amazing basic truths that would help us in our marriages, help us in our lives, help us as parents, and it's simply this, the principle of again. Congratulations to Brother Luke. He won a big contest this this week uh, for a, a body contest, and I look at him and get jealous of his body. I mean, I got that same body under here somewhere, I promise you that, but But the only way he could do that is by going back to the gym again and again and again and again and again and again and again. The Christian life is summed up in that word again. Let me give you a few statements. And don't get bored of this message, please, because we need this again and again. Number one, prep again. Prep again. Prepare again. Number one, look at this, 1 Samuel, or First Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Watch this. And I pray God, Paul says this about the church of Thessalonica. I pray God that your whole, look at this, spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that. He says it's in alphabetical order. Spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again soon. He's coming any time, in fact. And as Christians today, what a challenge it is to be spiritually prepared, have our soul ready and our body even prepared. But many of us have that out of order. You see, alphabetically, it should be body, soul, and spirit. But God's not concerned about alphabetical order right now. He's concerned about spiritual order. He's concerned about the again principle. He's concerned about how we're going to make it to verse 23 because of verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. And here it is. Here it is. We have to prepare again and again and again. Prepare right now to walk with God tomorrow. And then prep then on Monday to walk with him on Tuesday. And can I tell you something, my friend? And God will never be too busy for us. Every single day of our life, every single opportunity we have, make sure that we spend some time with God again and again, and again. And I'm one of those preachers that say it's quality over quantity. We're all very busy. I do get that. Life is crazy. Life is, is just, I mean, sometimes we get thrown uh, left and right. This morning has been an eventful morning for me. I'm not even going to tell you what happened to me this morning that detoured my morning, but I still had to work some things out and detail some things and make some things work out so I could get things done so I can get to the bus route. You never know what kind of wrench things are going to be thrown into life, but when you prepare, when you get yourself ready, it makes a difference in that daily principle of again, so you will not say those words, I'm bored. Daily prep. The goals have spirit, soul, and body in order. We fell miserably at that, and many of us put body first, and that gets us in trouble. I want to sleep just a little bit longer. 
I had a young preacher ask me last week, he's at 30, 29, 30 years old, and he sat down with me across a uh, table one day, and he said, uh, how do you get up early in the morning? How do you do it? I said, I just get up. He says, I hit the snooze button nine times before I get out of bed. I said, the snooze button is the most ridiculous invention in the history of mankind. All you're doing is postponing the inevitable. When the alarm goes off, get up. Why would you set it for 5 a.m. and then hit the snooze button until 6.15 Set the alarm for 6.15 and get up. That's better for you. And yet people all the time hit the snooze button. We all know what the snooze button. I'm not saying I've never hit it, but I probably only hit it two times since January 1st of this year. I don't like the snooze button. I hate it. You say, well, sometimes the alarm goes off and you don't feel like getting up. I know, but I get up. Why? Because I decided the night before that was a clock I was going to set. And by the way, the longer you do that, you'll be amazed how many times you'll wake up five minutes before the alarm goes off and you'll even feel better about yourself then. You say, well, are you saying never hit the snooze button? No, I'm not saying that. I'm trying to get us to see a point that many of us in the Christian life continue to hit the spiritual snooze button of our life. God is speaking us to our right now. God wants something right now, and we hit that snooze button. And, and I think most snooze buttons are hit for nine minutes. Who chose nine minutes? Nine minutes is a weird number. Go for ten. Get that extra minute because it will change your life and save you the rest of the day. But nine minutes it goes off. Nine minutes. I came across an alarm clock several years ago with technology today where a Navy SEAL's voice comes over the phone in the morning. And, he, and it literally goes like this. It goes, good morning. I'm going to give you the count of ten to get out of bed. One, two, three. And my wife used to roll over and say, tell that Navy SEAL to shut up. I said, you tell him. I ain't telling a Navy SEAL to shut up. When you hear a voice like that, you get out of bed quick. I always got up before the time he got to number two. The point I'm trying to make is this. The Holy Spirit so many times will come to us and speak to our hearts in a church service or as we walk with God. And they'll say, man, you got something not right there. There's something struggling right there. You're not doing this right. You're believing all the lies of the media today. You're swallowing it like a, like a fish who's hungry in a, in a pond. And, and you're struggling through life. And I'm giving you the truth right now. I want to help you. And we hit the snooze button over and over and over and over again. In the Christian walk, don't hit the snooze button. If you want to do it in your sleep, help yourself, but don't hit it in the Christian walk. Number one, prepare again, prep again. Number two, pray again. In the Simply Island, pray again and again and again. Brother Bussy's been hitting on that a lot lately. I listened to his message Friday on the way back from camp from this past Wednesday night. It seems like almost every time something gets hit about prayer, prayer is very important. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is asking of God. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is asking and seeking. And it's, it's praying for others and thinking of others again and again. And here it is in verse 17. Pray without sneezing. Sne I almost said pray without sneezing. <laughs> Bless you. But anyway, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, church. And it is so important. It is vital as Christians that we pray. Listen, I preached this several weeks ago. I think sometimes we have this, this notion that we've got to get up in the morning and spend two hours on our knees praying for God. Listen, this is, God would prefer this all day long. Just a quick little prayer here. You hear some negative news on the media. Pray for our country. Pray for your work. Pray for your wife. Pray for your kids. Just constantly again and again and again and again and again and you'll never get bored with prayer. Prep again. Pray again. Number three, I love this one. Praise again. Praise again. Churches, especially Baptist churches, have put so much emphasis on the prayer part. We have prayer requests in our churches. I quit doing that a long time ago. You can ask me. You can text me prayer requests. I'll be glad to pray for you. But when you ask for prayer requests, 50 people will raise their hand. But you ask for praises and two people will raise their hand. Through the years here, I'm just going to say it because I tell the truth around here. Someone came to me and says, why do you let so-and-so pray give testimonies all the time? I said, because you don't. Why would you complain about somebody else who's willing to give a testimony when you don't? Well, I don't believe in God giving God public praise. Well, then you must not believe this Bible. The Bible talks about public praise a lot. It's in the book of Psalms. In fact, there's an Old Testament story about how they were going to battle one day. They had their swords ready, sharpened and ready to go. But they started praising God under the mulberry trees. And God got so excited, he said, leave the swords alone, I'm going to whoop them for you. They didn't have to break a sweat that day. How about praising God again and again? But it's COVID. It's so much negativity in this world. Praise God. 
Find a reason to praise God today. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 18, in everything, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Teenagers ask me all the time, Brother Bill, Brother Randy, how do I find the will of God for my life? I'll tell you how you find the will of God for your life. By doing the will of God right now. And here's the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, stay pure. 1 Thessalonians 5, give thanks in everything. That's the will of God for you right now. Be thankful and praise God and praise God and be thankful and over and over and over again, again and again and again find a reason to praise God it could be a little thing it could be a big thing it might be just the meal you had this morning or the fact that we have air conditioning or that you got to church safely today whatever it is praise God again and again and again and again and you'll not get bored with a Christian life prep again pray again praise again number three I love this number four position yourself again get in the right position as a Christian many of us are positioning ourselves wrong if you watched this video a while ago, Kobe Bryant knew exactly where to be on the basketball court at any given moment. And when you travel to camps as much as I do and you see teenagers, most of these camps make everybody play and participate. And we all know there's some guys that should not pick up a basketball. But let me give those guys a shout out, okay? How many of you are nerds in here? Raise your hand, all right? Where's the nerds at? All right, listen, I, I, we love nerds. Nerds, let me help you with something. I preach a lot of camps, and I give the nerds a shout-out. I'll say, where's all the athletes at? And they always stand up real proud because, you know, the girls are looking. I'm an athlete. I'm, I'm a basketball star. I'm a football star. And, and I'll say, all right. And then I'll have the nerds stand up. And they always stand up kind of sheepishly like they're embarrassed. So they are standing up with their, you know, pocket protectors, 50 pans, and, you know, and all that stuff. And they stand up all embarrassed and sheepish and stuff. And I'll say, athletes, look at these guys. One day you're going to call them boss. There you go, nerds. There's a little shout-out for you. Bill Gates made more money in, I think, one week than Michael Jordan's made in his whole career. <laughs> Game over. Nerd wins. Right? And I'm telling you, man, last week even a few times, man, there was a canoe race at one of the camps. And you'd be amazed how many of the teens, the canoe's supposed to go this way. That means you roll like this. And they kept rolling like this. And the canoe was spinning. Look at me. Roll the right way. And they kept going this way. No, no, no. You're in the wrong position again. If you get in the right position again and again, you will make it from that side to this side. Right now, you're going to spend so much, you're going to miss dinner tonight. And there were several teenagers, even 14 and 15-year-old boys, who did not know how to row a canoe across a, a lake about as wide as this building. But they weren't in the right position. And my son one time looked at me during one of the games and says, Dad, there are no athletes on my team except one guy. <laughs> and they had some interesting games. I mean, literally, I watched it. The quarterback flipped the football three feet to one of his teammates. He went like this and dropped the ball. I didn't mean to hit you in the hands, buddy. It happens sometimes. But it's all about positioning. By the way, nerds, I did give you a shout-out today. We love nerds. Stay with me now. Stay with me now. Position yourself again. What does that mean? Look at verse number 19. Quench not the Spirit. Be in a position in your life where you're not hurting the Holy Spirit of God. Stay tender. What does that mean? Stay tender. Look at verse number 20. Despise not prophesying. When someone is preaching the Bible or teaching the Word of God to you, don't come in with a, I can't wait to find out what's wrong with it. Look for what's right with it. And if there's something wrong, call me out on it or whoever's teaching or preaching. I mean, I won't bite. I've made many mistakes in this pulpit, and I'll probably make some more, many more. But can I tell you something? I desire to please God. I want us and our church in the right position. I mean, listen, we are in a position, Brother Bussy, to do the Show Me Gospel Project this week. We are in a position to put 28, I'm sorry, I can't help but get excited about that, 28,000 John and Romans on every single house in our county. Isn't that exciting? Wow. But we'll never get to that point if we don't position ourselves right now. Despise not processing. Look at verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. Just because Fox News says it doesn't mean it's right. Investigate. Read. I can't believe how many people ask me how they should vote. I used to answer them. Now I'm going to say, hey, why don't you look it up and research it yourself? Think for yourself. Don't believe something just because the media tells you to. Don't believe what the masses teach us all the time. Don't believe the narrative on racism right now because the media portrays it wrong. Get educated yourself. Find out what the Bible says about it. 
Find out what's happening in our country. Be hungry and learn. Position yourselves. And you'll have the wisdom to help instead of hurt. We have a problem in America today because so many people are willing to be a part of the problem rather than part of the solution. When somebody does something bad, somebody else thinks the best way to fix it is to do something bad back to them, and then they do something bad back to them, and it becomes a vicious cycle again and again. But if somebody interrupts that cycle and says, hey, instead of doing something bad to each other, instead of hating each other, because when this crowd hates this crowd, this crowd will hate this crowd back. But if somebody throws a wrench in it, a good wrench, and says, let's bring love into it, love will prevail, love will defeat hate. But we're not positioning ourselves again and again and again. Look at verse number 22. Oh, by the way, it says, hold fast that which is good. That's this. This is good. Verse 22, again, abstain from all appearance of evil. Oh, that's a great truth right there. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Be in the right position as a Christian. Stand out from the world. Be different from the world. But then go into the world and love them and help them. The only difference between me and the lost crowd right now is the fact that Jesus Christ has saved my soul. I am a sinner today. I'll be the first to admit that. But God's been good to me and he saved me. He gave me a Bible. And the Holy Spirit has taught me. And because I decided many, many years ago that no matter how tired I am, no matter how late I went to bed the night before, I'm going to get up the same time every morning. And I'm going to walk with God and seek God's face out. It's amazing how all those little agains, that Monday morning, that Thursday morning when nobody knew, when even my wife and kids were still in bed, those again and again and again make all the difference in the world. They make a difference, church. Now watch this. Don't miss this. I love this. My favorite point is the last one. I'm done. Number one, prep again. Number two, pray again. Number three, praise again. Number four, position again. Number five, plan again. Well, preacher, you already said prep again. No, no, this is different. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. My favorite verse of this passage. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Here's what you can plan on every time. You can plan on God being there when you show up again and again and again and again. Tomorrow morning, you can plan on God being there again. Or tomorrow night, whenever it is you pray or meditate or talk to God, plan on God being there again and again and again. Can I tell you something? I've missed a few appointments with God, but God's never missed an appointment with me. I'm so thankful for that today. You know, it's a blessing that if you make a decision, you say, you know what, man, I, I hear what you're saying, preacher. It is the little things. Maybe I've gotten bored of the Christian life. I'm bored with the way I live. I'm bored with my perspective on God. I'm bored of the Bible. I'm bored of prayer. I'm bored of the spiritual activities. I'm only here because I have to be here. I'm only here because, man, we're just supposed to go to church. I'm only here because, well, you know, I like this church, but, but I'm missing out. I'm not going to that next level. Can I encourage you today? Can I encourage you to make some decisions and prep again and pray again and praise again and position again? And when you do those those daily mundane simple tasks, those few little things that you do, the little things, guess what? You can mark it down. You can take it to the bank. You can plan on it. God will meet with you every day. He doesn't miss appointments. I have. I've missed appointments. We've all gotten flat tires on off. We've all made mistakes. We've all been late for that. We've all made these, these errors and stuff. God will never. God wants to be here. That's what I love. Look at this. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And one of the pleas of God, and I'm just about through, when God was walking on this earth, when Jesus Christ was walking on this planet, his, his desire, his hunger, his question that he wanted to answer was simply this. Is there faith on earth? And the one time he was impressed, it wasn't even a Jew. It was a centurion servant. The Bible says it's the only time in the Gospels where Jesus was marveling or amazed or shocked. Literally, Jesus' jaw dropped. He was like, whoa, I've not found so great faith in all what? Israel. Look at this guy. Listen, church. Kobe Bryant never got bored of the basics. I read the other day about The Rock. Everybody knows who The Rock is, right? Famous actor. He always looked good, and now he was this good, and now he's this big. I just wonder how he got that big. But anyway, that's a whole other subject. But I did read this about him. He said, it never matter. he said he never worries about what time he goes to bed. He only worries about what time he gets up. Every morning, never fail, 4.45 a.m., he gets up. So he can work out for 45 minutes cardio, 45 minutes of weightlifting. So he's done an hour and a half workout before most people have even woke up in this world. 
He said he recently flew to London and got in at 2 a.m. That's jet lag plus 2 a.m. He said it didn't matter. He lay down in his hotel bed, set his alarm for 445, and he got up at 445. I'm not saying we're supposed to do that. I'm not saying... I'm not saying that that's, that, I hope you, if, you, if, you, if that's all you get for the message, you're missing the point. The point I'm trying to make is simply this. He does it for Hollywood. Kobe Bryant did it for a basketball. I'm not saying we're supposed to get up at 4.45 a.m. or live only in two hours of sleep. I am saying this. Make sure every day you do something with God again and again and again and again. Never get bored of the basics. My wife and I try to have a date night every week. We do it most weeks of our life. Sometimes we get away for our anniversary, do something special. But the date nights every week aren't always spectacular, are they, babe? We don't always have fancy fireworks and roses and bouquets and roses on the table, which I've done that a few times. But I'll tell you what it does do for our marriage. It helps us recharge. She knows that when I sit down at that dining room table or that table at the restaurant, the phone is going to be in the car. So what if somebody dies, preacher? They'll be dead when the meal is over. Somebody say amen right there. (laughs) She needs to know she's got all of me, and I need to know I have all of her for just a few hours a week. We do that again and again and again, and we wake up one morning, and it's like, wow, we've been married 23 years now. It's those simple things, church. It's not the big things. Maybe we've portrayed it all wrong. We've taught little two- and three-year-old kids from the time they enter Sunday school. All only We make it almost sound like the Christian life is unattainable because all we teach them is David killed Goliath and Moses did this and Elijah did that. And I'm not against that. But those two- and three-year-olds also need to know this. The most exciting thing in your day every day is this, that the creator of the universe, the one who created Moses and David, the one who created you and me, wants to spend time with you again and again and again and again God is good I'm bored God the Father says hey if you're bored show up with me sometime tomorrow and we'll take care of that problem you won't be so bored then love and appreciate your church heads about eyes are closed heads about eyes are closed our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed today. No pianist today. I don't think we'll do the pianist today. I want it to kind of be quiet for this invitation today. I want us to be in a meditative thought. And just in a kind of a quiet mood, a somber mood, a sober mood. We just kind of think about God. And this is, a, this is an opportunity for you, just you and God, to think and talk right now. And this is the neat thing. He's able to listen to and talk to all of you at the same time. First of all, though, are you saved? You know for sure you're going to heaven someday when you die. You say, preacher, I'm, I'm not sure that I've been saved. I'm not sure that I've been born again. You, you're not even his child yet until you get born again. See, so many people have this weird perspective of God because God is God, but he's not everybody's father. He becomes your father when you get born again. You've heard my testimony. We got visitors here, sprinkled, three to- or sprinkled as a baby, baptized three times growing up. I only knew God as God, and and he's still a good God even to people that don't know him as Father. But one day I got born again, and God became my Father, and I became his Son, and it changed everything. My life has not been easy. It's not been a bed of roses, but I'm glad I'm in the family of God, and I have a Father. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder this question, if simply this, do you have a spiritual birthday? I know you've had a physical birthday. You will not be here today. All of us know our physical birthday. Have you had a spiritual birthday? With their heads bowed and eyes closed, I want someone to say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I've been saved. I'm not sure that I've been born again. Pray for me. If that's you, would you quietly lift up your hand? I want to pray for you. Anybody here in the building today? Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure that I've been born again. All right. Let me ask you this question then. Are you bored? Are you bored of the Christian life? Are you bored with your walk with God? Are you bored in your Bible reading? Are you bored? Are you just... Bored. Has God become kind of a, is your walk with God kind of become blah? Maybe today we just need to realize the principle of again. Work at it again. I'm going to hush up and be quiet. The altar's open. Some are already here. You can just come, take a few moments, and just say, Lord, here I am again. And I want to spend time with you again and again and again. So are you saying I got to do, no, it's not about an hour every morning. It might be only five minutes or ten minutes tomorrow morning. But make it happen. 
Think about what he's done for you lately and thank him for it. Read a chapter in a psalm and thank him for it. Text your wife and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm thankful for you today. Text your husband and say, hey, thank you for working so hard for us. Write a note to your kid and say, hey, I love you, buddy. Write a note to your daughter and say you love her. It's the little things, church, that you do again and again and again that make a big difference. Pray, I do believe one has come for salvation, too. I'm going to hush up. The altars are open. Thank you so much for listening so well today. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus, he came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we've got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I'd be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says or what I have ideas about or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.